evening to you all, and uh, thank you so much for uh, for coming out tonight. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Stephen Weatherseed. I'm going to be moderating uh, this evening's uh, session. Uh, we, I know we started just a few minutes late, but uh, relatively speaking, we're, we're pretty much on time. So thank you for that. Thank you for turning up early enough, and, uh, and thank you for making some inroads into the food and drink outside as well. I hate to see that go to waste. Um, just, just a few words of, of introduction, but uh, first of all, I'm a, a, a few words of thanks beforehand. To, firstly, thanks to uh, Chinese U for making this facility, this marvelous facility, available. Uh, as well as making Mimi available, I'm not too sure whether Mimi was made available and then the facility or, or, or vice versa, but uh, uh, terrific uh, that, that uh, we can have this facility here. Thanks also to the Economist uh, Information Unit for. Um, uh, for their input in, into the report, and we'll come on to that in a minute, and that obviously is the main topic for, for this evening. Um, uh, thank you also to yourselves for, for turning up. It was um, when we, uh, at Bazaar, when we embarked on, on uh, putting on this function, we weren't too sure quite what response we'd get. Um, but uh, it's been uh, extraordinarily, well, more than a pleasant surprise, it's been extraordinarily eye-opening, frankly, uh, how much interest there is in this topic across a whole, the whole section, uh, the whole spectrum, if you like, of, of interests. And, and uh, as you can hopefully see and, and talk uh, among yourselves here tonight, you can see it's right, ranging, obviously, from the academic, through NGOs, through government, uh, right through to, uh, to top corporates. So it really is spanning the, uh, spanning the interest. So th thank you also for coming, because of the, the format of this, this evening, uh, Laurel, who I'll introduce in a minute, Laurel will, will introduce the report uh, for 15, 20 minutes or so. Uh, Mimi will then uh, follow on with some, some other comments, uh, bringing some of the issues uh, more closer to home. Uh, and then we will open the floor to, to Q&A. And I think, uh, as ever, stimulated by the comments from, uh, from the experts, uh, it's, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully get some very interesting Q&A which we can uh, um, give us some more food for thought to, uh, to take away. Um, the, topic, the topic, of course, is not new. Um, you know, human rights. You know, I'm no academic. I'm just a humble accountant. But um, you know, I suspect all of us are, are aware of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a as, as a concept, and, and probably many of us <coughs> tend to reflect that uh, that's that's something that, that uh, government uh, ministers and, and foreign ministers are. You know, it's their area uh, of interest. But what does it mean for business? And and uh, it has actually. I mean, it's a surprise to me. It was, has actually been on the agenda, uh, so I'm told, at the UN for quite some years. And it really came to more prominence, if you like. It came to more prominence with the publication just a few years ago of, uh, of a publication that some of you may be familiar with, but others may not, called The Guiding Principles. And uh, coming out of those guiding principles, which certainly raised the, the uh, um, level of publicity, if you like, of, of the relevance of human rights, that what, what does business do Sorry, what is, what is, uh, how relevant are, are, are the concepts of human rights to business and what is, what is business's role as far as uh, human rights are concerned? And it put it firmly on the agenda uh, in, in the international arena. And uh, following that report, um, the, the uh, debate has continued uh, and uh, a further um, uh, guide, if you like, guide to the implementation of uh, some of the lessons coming out of that, uh, out of the guiding principles, was, was just published uh, two or three months ago, um, called the Reporting Framework, uh, for those of you who've gone through it, but uh, it's I don't know, about 100 pages or so. Um, but uh, but in an easy read, it's a, it's a, if I say so myself, it was sponsored by Grant Thornton, or worked on by, sorry, worked on by Bazaar, not, uh, that's a fruit slip I shouldn't make, um, worked on by Bazaar, uh, together with another organization called SHIFT. Uh, and as we speak, um, the, the, the reporting framework is being extended to the assurance standards to go with that framework to help uh, provide assurance around uh, what does it mean if you, if you comply or not, uh, what kind of uh, assurance reports are going to go with it. So that's being worked on right now. So that's the environment we're in. Um, and just to add to the add to the piece, I know there are sort of one or two people here, or a few actually, uh, either consul generals or people associated with the EU here. Uh, and there was an EU directive that was finally signed off by the council uh, last year, uh, October, November last year, that is going to require um, uh, a lot of the very large companies, a lot of the large corporates in Europe, actually to start reporting uh, on their compliance in this area uh, from about 2017, as I understand. So it becomes far more relevant 
directly relevant, um, quite apart from whether it's, it's perceived to be a good thing or a, a worthwhile thing, if you like, for companies to get involved in. You know, certainly for companies operating in that part of the world, it, it, it gets even higher on their agenda. Enough of that from me. Let me just introduce our two speakers uh, tonight. We've got uh, um, from the Economist uh, Information Unit, uh, Laurel, Laurel West. Laurel, uh, Laurel's been uh, here in Asia for uh, more than 20 years. Um, she's a director uh, for the EIU, uh, heading up their thought leadership program. Uh, she's responsible for their sponsored research programs here in Asia. And prior to her current role, she was a member of the country analysis team specializing in India. Um, so again, very relevant, I think, to uh, some of the issues we're likely to, to touch on tonight. Uh, her current role covers Asia from Australia to India and, and covering a wide range of topics, uh, most recently consumer markets, environment for internet-based business, and women's role in corporate Asia. So, boy, there's another spectrum. Um, our second speaker, uh, Mimi, Mimi Zhou, Professor Mimi Zhou, sorry. Um, Mimi has a, a five-page CV. I'm not going to read it all I <laughs> Uh, you'll find it online, um, but uh, joking aside, it's extremely impressive uh, by anyone's, uh, anyone's standards. She has degrees in law, economics, and social sciences from a variety of universities. I'm not even going to name them because it just goes on too long. Uh, and, but her current roles, and, and sorry, she's also a, uh, uh, she's a, she's a, a practicing solicitor, admitted both in England and Wales and here in Hong Kong, and, um, and, and Australia, I think. I, too many of them, really. Um, uh, and Mimi is uh, part of the uh, CUHK Law Faculty here, uh, which she joined just uh, just last year, with uh, research and teaching interests in areas of Chinese law, legal system, international business law, employment law, contract law, immigration law, and elder law. Um, she teaches the legal system of the PRC, China contract law, blah, 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 blah. So, <laughs> covering all of that. Probably more of, of even more relevance, she, she is an Associate Director for the Centre for Rights and Justice at the faculty here, and uh, also a member of the Advisory Board of CUHK's Centre for, for Bioethics. So, um, hopefully that's established in these credentials, um, and we look forward to her comments as well. But without further ado, I've certainly spoken long enough, let me uh, pass over to Laura, if I may. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, good evening, evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I have to say I, too, am surprised at the turnout. And I'll be very curious to hear your questions afterwards to hear what your interest is in this area. Um, I'd like to start just by saying a word about the Economist, <laughs> the Economist Intelligence Unit. It occurs to me that uh, not all of you will be familiar with us. We are a sister company of the Economist magazine, or newspaper, as we like to call it. Uh, we specialize in uh, country information, we do country reports, forecasts, uh, risk reports, etc. on just about every country around the world. And we also undertake uh, special research projects on topics of interest, such as the one that I'm here to talk about tonight, which is business and human rights. I thought we'd begin with uh, just a little bit of uh, history to give um, the findings of our research some, uh, some context here. So I believe that most of us, when we think about business and human rights, we tend to think about it in a modern context, uh, looking at events like the terrible tragedy that happened in Bangladesh with the collapse of the Rana Plaza factory building, or stories that we hear about how our running shoes and iPhones are made in China. Um, but the discussion about human rights and business actually has quite a long history. And two, two trends uh, have made the involvement of business in the discussion of human rights rather inevitable. The first is the spread of aspirational statements followed by legal instruments promoting respect for human rights. And this started with the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, and there have been dozens more since then. As you can see from the slide, there are something like nine core UN human rights treaties and eight optional protocols signed since 1965. I bet that makes for some good bedtime reading. Um, these are only the most prominent ones. There are dozens of others. The second uh, driver uh, that's pushing the discussion of human rights onto the business uh, agenda is the internationalization of business. As you can see from the slide, there has been a dramatic increase in the number of transnational corporations over the past few decades. It's risen from about 10,000 in 1970 to about 80,000 in uh, 
2008, which seems to be the last year for which uh, an estimate is available, believe it or not. Now, efforts to, oops, to um, directly link human rights and business have been rather fraught. There's been a lot of debate about whether, how, and in what form business should <coughs> respect human rights. And this goes back to the 1970s. As you can see from the, uh, the little history I've put up here, um, although the UN's Commission on Transnational Corporations was established in the early 70s, it took until 1990 for the CTC to come up with a draft code. And this was uh, abandoned after four years, uh, after a lot of disagreement between developed and developing countries over the degree to which this should be legally binding. It was a similar story with the UN Subcommission on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights. It took five years to come up with draft guidelines, and these so-called norms fell victim to opposition from an even wider range of sources, including the business community, some developed country governments who objected to direct imposition of binding requirements, as well as some human rights NGOs who didn't think that uh, it should be business's obligation to, um, sorry, uh, that these sorts of um, obligations should not be placed on business when they in, in uh, reality belong to the state. So finally, in 2011, came the publication of the Guiding Principles that Stephen uh, mentioned earlier. And these have achieved uh, widespread acceptance. Um, sorry, got ahead of myself there. Um, the Guiding Principles, they're not binding obligations, as I'm sure most of you know, but rather they outline the existing uh, responsibilities of both governments and business. For business, they explain that respecting human rights effectively involves consideration of companies' direct activities as well as the broader impact of what they do. Now, these should include, at a minimum, having a human rights policy in some form, an appropriate human rights uh, due diligence, and a remediation process in the event of a complaint or grievance. So, taking the context of all of this, four years since the guiding principles were introduced, our research is looking at how corporations are thinking and behaving um, as they wrestle with the practical implications of respecting human rights. Now, the aim of our research was to improve understanding in several areas. First of all, to what degree do companies perceive a responsibility to respect human rights? Um, second, within companies, which departments or levels of the organization are most likely to take the lead informing uh, human rights policies or leading on human rights issues. Um, what are the main drivers of, of corporate activity in respect to human rights? What are the main barriers to such activity? And finally, how well do companies communicate both internally and externally concerning their human rights related activities? Now our research involved a global survey that was conducted late last year. We surveyed over 800 senior corporate executives um, across a range of industries and uh, company sizes. And before anyone asks, uh, it was a global survey. We did not have a huge sample of Hong Kong and China-based companies. I think the total uh, for the two together was about 4%, so we won't be doing a deep dive into what companies here think. But I think it's safe to say that the, the corporations and the executives that did answer these questions um, they're all transnational corporations that would have been thinking about their operations in this part of the world, particularly in China, when they were responding to the questionnaires. So what did we find? <clears throat> well, first of all, we found that a large majority of executives that we surveyed now believe that business is an important player in respecting human rights, and that what their companies do, or fail to do, affects those rights. So, in the survey, 83% of respondents agree that human rights are a matter for business as well as governments. Similarly, 71% say their company's responsibility to respect these rights goes beyond simple obedience. Excuse me. <coughs> I'm fighting what we call in Hong Kong air conditioner cold. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, 71% say that their company's responsibility to respect these rights goes well beyond simple obedience to local laws. This is a remarkable change. According to one of our interviewees from Human Rights Watch, Human Rights Watch <clears throat> as late as the 1990s, there was no recognition at all that companies had human rights responsibilities. This simply wasn't even um, discussed for the most part. And the degree of agreement isn't just on one or two areas. We asked our survey respondents to indicate what areas of human rights were relevant to their business operations. 
For each of the 11 clusters of human rights, most respondents reported that their firm's operations had some impact. But this ranges from working conditions, which I would think is a no-brainer, but I suppose if you're not the most up and up company operating a shoe factory in China, maybe it's not a consideration for you. Um, but it extends all the way down to uh, rights related to land. And if our survey results are to be believed, and I certainly hope they are, um, companies are not doing this uh, for the money. Um, they see human rights mainly as a stakeholder and ethical issue, and a business case for respecting human rights focused on immediate costs and benefits is less widely accepted. The leading drivers of corporate human rights policies um, are broadly consistent across industries and regions, and these are building sustainable relationships with local communities, protecting the company brand and reputation, meeting employee expectations, and moral and ethical considerations. Now, of course, such stakeholder and ethical issues have a substantial impact on the long-term profitability of the company, but only 21% of the respondents said that a clear business case is driving their human rights policy. Similarly, when companies were asked what are the main barriers they face in addressing human rights, only 15% agreed with the statement, business would incur costs and or see profit margins reduced. However, while corporations, <coughs> sorry, corporate attitudes are evolving fairly quickly, concrete steps to reform company policies um, and to communicate such changes externally are moving somewhat more slowly. Our survey shows that just 22% have a publicly available human rights policy in some form. Now, interpreting that is you know, a matter of perspective. For some people, figures such as these are encouragingly high especially given the relatively short length of time that corporate human rights have been on the corporate agenda. Uh, as the government relations manager of Anglo-American, who was interviewed for this report, puts it, big corporations need time to change, processes take time to change, it's just reality. But other people focus on the gap between the proportion of respondents willing to acknowledge the importance of human rights to business and the smaller proportion saying that they have taken action. Our interviewee from Human Rights Watch, for example, says that, quote, a lot of companies don't do these things, and he sees no real shift in the business environment. So I suppose it's only time will tell whether, you know, all of this good intentions are, are translated into actual action. Now here you can see that um, there are a few companies who are, yet to, or who are yet at a stage where they're communicating the human right, rights policies externally. So just over one-fifth of the companies do not communicate about their policy either internally or externally. But who takes the lead on human rights? Well, we think it would be an issue for the C-suite, but as you can see from this chart, only 44% of our respondents report that their CEO takes the lead. What I'm not showing here, actually, is that 37% of the respondents said that nobody takes the lead. <laughs> that um, is actually it's not great news, as I think you would agree. Um, what probably is more inspiring is the fact that human rights activities seem to be integrated into a wider range of departments. Beyond the leadership role, uh, our research showed that at over 50% of the companies surveyed, there were at least seven separate functions involved in this area. According to our interviewee from Coca-Cola, this, uh, this is the gold standard here. Uh, at Coke, human rights governance comes from their global workplace rights group, but in reality it requires input, um, the input of and cooperation from a number of departments and functions, including procurement, technical, legal, public affairs, and enterprise risk, just to name a few. The um, next onto the barriers of addressing human rights. Um, certainly, as I've mentioned, companies are still coming to grips with what their responsibilities mean in practice. And this process is going to take time. Um, in fact, when it comes to human rights, one of the uh, industry groups we spoke to called Tech UK, which as the name would suggest, represents the tech industry, um, says simply that you know businesses often don't even know where to start. So according to our survey, uh, in terms of barriers, the respondents list a lack of understanding of their company's responsibilities in this area and a lack of training and education for employees as the first and third most common barriers to progress. Similarly, new initiatives that respondents say uh, would be most likely to help them in this area are about providing data. 40% said that public benchmarking of company performance would help, and 32% said 
that they need access to reliable, independent, independent information on country-level human rights um, situations. That's not a plot for buying economist intelligence unit reports, I might add. Um, for many companies, the, uh, the issue of coming to grips with the human rights issue in terms of what it means for their companies is enormously complex. I mean, even for companies like Coca-Cola, uh, <coughs> excuse me, which uh, is well experienced uh, in this area, uh, the challenge is really just staggering. I mean, to just look at their issue of procurement, if they want to really be able to understand that and control it, Coca-Cola needs a detailed overview of the supply chain that involves 30 agricultural commodities in 207 countries. You can imagine what that entails. Um, there are also a range of organizations that are seeking to address human rights policy on an industry level so that they can advise their, their members. And our report looks at two such efforts, one in financial services and the other in technology. Um, Tech UK, the industry group that I just mentioned uh, a minute ago, has been working to educate its members on the fact that due diligence in sales involves not just knowing one's customers, but knowing the political and legal contexts in which they operate. But companies lack, set, lack access to um, such data which helps them understand these contexts. Um, the other group that we uh, discuss in our paper, the, the Thumb Group, is an informal collection of banks, and they actually uh, formed even before the guiding principles were introduced. Uh, but they pointed to the same issue of um, complexity and point out that the, the problem is even worse for financial institutions because respect for human rights can mean one thing to the investment banking division and quite another thing to the retail operations within the same institution. And they have suggested that um, consulates could play a much greater role in providing companies with information on the ground. And I was thinking that it could be a great opportunity for the dozens of graduate students who come knocking on my door about this time of year looking for, uh, for work, mainly having graduated in the international relations or international affairs field. <clears throat> and I always wonder where they're going to end up. Um, the same uh, financial services group has reported greater engagement with NGOs, which until very recently was something that just wasn't heard of. The two sides, uh, in my experience, seem to be at war with each other. Um, and also, they're engaging a lot more with governments, who are keen to understand how they're interpreting the guiding principles so that they can take this into consideration and then formulating their own national action plans. Um, in our research, we also identified the leaders in terms of corporate action on human rights. And by this I mean companies that believe that they are ahead of their competitors in terms of human rights policies. Um, this group accounted for about 25% of the survey sample. Uh, even these leaders acknowledge that they still have a lot to learn, but they do have several things in common. First of all, they have internalized uh, respect for human rights. 52% of this group say that moral and ethical considerations are the leading factor in their human rights policies, and this compares with just 39% of, of other companies in the sample. Um, they're also less likely than other firms to say that their corporate culture is a, is a barrier to uh, acting on human rights issues. They tend to have senior leadership actively involved in human rights issues, and unsurprisingly, they are more likely to have um, human rights policies that are communicated both externally and internally. Where they are similar to the other companies, however, is inciting a lack of understanding um, as a barrier to further progress. This is not because their efforts have not failed to bring knowledge. It's quite the opposite in fact. Their efforts to understand the issues has just led them to understand how complex they really are. And finally, um, our research, of course, uh, raises the question, yeah, is business doing enough? Um, as our interviewees pointed out, and I've, I've said several times now, this is a complex issue that takes time for companies to really get up to speed on. But at the same time, there are some parties who feel business definitely is not moving fast enough. Uh, five countries have already introduced national action plans on business and human rights, and another 18 countries are, uh, have such plans under development. There is also another resolution before the UN Human Rights Council to begin negotiations on a legally binding international treaty. Uh, of course, this is very controversial in raising the usual um, 
issues in terms of uh, what should be legally binding and what's not. But very interestingly, 20% uh, of our uh, survey sample thought that this would be a good thing that would actually help them. So with these things going on at the moment and, and the um, policies that Stephen made reference to, it's not difficult to imagine that if companies do not change sufficiently and do not do so quickly enough, that we could return to contentious disagreements about imposing more restrictive uh, regulation or indeed that such regulation comes into force in the near future. And I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurel. Let me... Um I was, I was shown how to do this before. Oops, I'm not sure, <laughs> not sure that picture should happen. Um, ah, the next one is coming. Okay, thank you. That, uh, was, don't worry, that's purely backdrop. Um, let, let, let's now, without further ado, pass over to Mimi for her comments as well. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening. Um, thank you very much for coming um, to um, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, I'm not here representing the Chinese University, the University of Hong Kong. Um, as an academic and as a um, practicing lawyer, uh, spe especially in the field of employment, um, my comments today will be um, very specific um, in respect to um, the employment-related issues that the report has uh, raised, given that the um, majority, a vast majority, 93% of the companies um, who are respondents to um, the report have identified this as the key issue of human rights that is relevant to the business. As Laurel said, it sounds obvious, but I want to flesh out exactly what this um, concern with conditions of work means, and particularly in the context of Asia. So um, by way of background, I actually have been a consultant to the International Labour Organization for the last 10 years in the Asia Pacific region. I've worked on various projects ranging from forced labour, migrant labour, uh, to promoting social dialogue and uh, collective bargaining across um, different um, uh, Asian countries. So for me, um, this report really shows that the game changer has been the attitudes of businesses uh, since the 90s, um, from, you could say, a reluctance and even um, confrontation often with human rights NGOs around the world to now embracing human rights um, as part of the fabric of what they do. Um, so there's also recognition, um, as this report highlights, that business res respect for human rights um, goes well beyond just a matter of legal compliance and well beyond a case of it's good for business in terms of the bottom line. So looking at then this particular cluster of human rights for businesses, conditions of employment and work, um, what is interesting in the report is that actually 93% of respondents saw it as uh, very relevant um, to their business operations, um, and a much lower 74% saw um, a related workers' rights issue, which is workplace dialogue, that is freedom to associate and, collective, uh, and the right to collective bargaining, as, um, as relevant. But it's still a very high percentage, 74%. So the question is that I want to pose um, in my commentary, my very brief commentary, is how do we move in Asia in the context of employment rights um, from a race to the bottom to the race to the top for one billion workers in Asia? So how do we move from, as the title suggests, principles to practice? Just to offer some of my, before offering some of my suggestions, um, I think we need to put it in context. And as Stephen has highlighted, what's really important about us launching the report tonight uh, in the context of Asia is um, for us to highlight um, you know, some of the you know, hot issues um, that businesses, transnational companies operating in Asia face. 
And so for me, obviously labour has been a very important issue of the last few decades. Um, Asia is often considered a sweatshop of the world. Um, just some statistics from the International Labour Organization. One million workers in Asia die every year from work-related incidents, injuries, or diseases. More than 120 million of Asia's workers are children. 120 million out of one billion. So, the last two decades we've seen really high, very visible kind of um, consumer-led campaigns in the West um, towards very visible companies like Nike, um, all the way from the 1990s. Um, for those, some of you who are my students may not remember um, back then, um, but during that time, um, some of you may remember Na Gap, Nike, a lot of the big um, apparel uh, manufacturers faced a lot of pressures with respect to um, them having this image as running sweatshops across Asia, um, from India to China and Bangladesh. And the executives, um, for example, of Nike, uh, for them, this image of being you know, a, a sweatshop operator um, was more than just an embarrassment uh, because actually it threatened sales um, because um, consumers perceived um, you know, these companies as um, you know, the, the brand and reputation was destroyed. And so I guess in that sense you can say there was a pressing business case uh, for them to address these issues. We do then move on to more recent times. Um, it's not just the apparel uh, manufacturers um, that are subject and their retailers that are subject to this sort of consumer scrutiny. Um, we have obviously um, in China the last few years um, companies like Foxconn, a major supplier to um, you know, electronic manufacturers around the world, Apple, Samsung, um, Take a guess how many employees actually Foxconn hires. 1.2 million. It's a very, very large um, um, electronics manufacturer. Um, people may remember in 2010, um, at the time I was at the IOO, um, and um, we looked at the 18 attempted suicides by Foxconn employees. Actually, 14 of them died. Um, and. As a result, Foxconn um, did increase some of the wages in their factories. Uh, what was more interesting, they also put um, suicide nets around the factories. Um, in fact, I heard um, one of my uh, contacts um, who were, um, was in Foxconn was saying they were um, also inviting uh, Buddhist monks to come into the factory and offering prayers for the workers. Um, and. Um, Oh, also, um, employees were also asked to sign no suicide pledges. <laughs> so, um, Apple obviously saw that this was a very worrying concern um, that their major supplier, um, you know, arguably not doing a lot um, to address what was quite tragic um, and was attracting headlines around the world. Um, so Apple then engaged um, a US-based labor organization um, to conduct an investigation into Foxconn. Um, and uh, the investigation identified that excessive working hours was a real issue. Um, you know, 100 hours, I mean, I've been a corporate slave before, so I know what the 100 hours are like, but I'm definitely paid, I was definitely paid a lot more than um, what Foxconn workers were paying, or were being paid uh, for working 100 hours a week. Um, and then of course we saw the um, unfortunate tragedy of Bangladesh and um, garment workers um, at the Rana Plaza factory collapse um, only two years ago. Um, and what's interesting is from that incident, four businesses um, involved was that actually very few um, agreed to a proposal for compensation for the victims' families. And there was considerable disagreement between North American companies and European companies as to the right response um, to the incident. So that led to, um, I guess, a split um, between um, you know, a mostly American alliance that was calling for a non-binding agreement 
um, addressing this issue, and then the Europeans were more into, I guess, the hard law um, instruments and um, the European um, sort of garment manufacturers, um, like H&M, for example, uh, went into a more legally binding accord. So that, that also raises very interesting issues about, you know, um, yes, businesses agree that, you know, um, there is, we should respect human rights, but how to actually do so, um, there's inevitably going to be disagreements, um, and of course, um, companies will like to take approaches that um, they believe um, are tailored to their particular um, business operations. That is just the reality. Um, as the Bangladesh response response to the Bangladesh factory collapse um, shown, so um, basically, how do we then move um, businesses in Asia um, to from principle to practice? And I just want to propose, um, particularly in the context that I was formerly a um, in, in labor international labor organization consultant, the concept of decent work. So decent work is some of you in the room may have heard of this kind of catch cry of decent work uh, for all. Um, it's enshrined in the ILO's Declaration on Social Justice for a Fair Globalization back in 1999. The idea of decent work is more than just a job. It's more than just having enough for the one billion workers in Asia. It's about real opportunities for women and men in Asia to obtain decent and productive work in conditions of freedom, in conditions of equity, security, and human dignity. Now, decent work agenda encompasses um, four strategic objectives, which is about creating jobs, guaranteeing rights at work, extending social protections, and promoting social dialogue. Now, these objectives, um, you may think, well, what about creation of jobs and extending social protections? If you're a neoclassical economist, you may think that they might not be very compatible. But um, the ILO considers these objectives to be inseparable, interrelated, and mutually supportive. So decent work in Asia, why is it significant? Because we are at the end of the decade of decent work in Asia. So in 2006, Governments, workers, organizations, and employees' organizations uh, in Asia Pacific um, committed themselves to uh, this special decade, the decade of decent work for the Asia Pacific. And so this is the final year of this commitment. Um, I won't go into whether things have been achieved, but um, a good measure of whether decent work um, has been promoted is to see um, how many countries have signed up to the fundamental core conventions, uh, which I refer to as the IOO's fundamental principles and rights at work. And this is the starting point, in my view, for businesses in Asia to tackle labour issues. The fundamental principles and rights at work um, announced by the um, IOO consist of first, the freedom to associate and organize, which protects workers' rights to independently form and join trade unions of their own choosing, and the freedom to bargain collectively with employers. Second, eliminating all forms of forced or compulsory labor. Now for businesses, often the line between very poor working conditions, say in your factories of suppliers, um, and forced labour can be seen as a continuum. It's really difficult to draw the line. What I can say is that at the moment, governments around the world are paying a lot of attention to issues of modern slavery and forced labour. And so businesses can really, the ones who are, for example, surveyed in this um, report, can really play a leading role in this um, current um, very hot political agenda by ensuring um, decent working conditions throughout their supply chains. Number three of the ILO's fundamental principles um, and rights at work concerns child labour. Okay, as I've said before, 120 million of Asia's workers are children. Now, it doesn't mean that we should stop all work performed by children. I mean, back in the days, my family had a Chinese restaurant. I was eight and I was also 
you know, worked. Um, so it just means that what we need to focus on is what constitutes as acceptable and unacceptable uh, forms of work for children at different age and stages of development. And importantly, as the IOO has recognised, um, providing relevant and accessible basic education is crucial to abolishing child labour, particularly the worst forms of child labour. So here we can see that beyond just auditing supply chains to find instances of forced labour and child labour, there is actually a role for businesses to play also in promoting the right to education in poorer communities, especially as the report has highlighted a key driver for businesses to be involved and active in human rights issues is to build sustainable relationships with local communities in which they operate. So finally, the, um, the final fundamental principle is about eliminating discrimination in respect to employment and occupation. Now, many of you here are probably wary also there's a business case for eliminating discrimination because we want the best people in the job based on merit, regardless of um, you know, their sex, um, race, ethnicity, um, homos um, sexual orientation, etc. Uh, but it goes beyond just having recruitment policies um, and, and pay structures that try and get rid of these biases. I think one of the key things to dis dismantle the barriers to um, um, discrimination is ensuring equality in access to training and education, as well as the ability for employees to own and use resources, um, some of which have already been mentioned and identified in the report. Now, these are the fundamental principles and rights at work that the IMO has come up with. In Asia, not many countries have signed up to some of the core ILO conventions. And in particularly, the conventions related to freedom to associate and freedom to collectively bargain uh, has the lowest rate of ratification in Asia. Okay? So if laws alone, if governments don't have the laws to protect some of these fundamental rights, then who or what can? What if government regulations for example, labour laws in this part of the world, do not go far enough. What can businesses do? I think this is a really interesting question, which I can't have direct answers to, and maybe we can discuss this in the Q&A. Because when I read the report, um, what I, one point that, I really, um, that came to my attention was when businesses operate in countries where state governance is weak, and that companies' actions actually tend to have greater human rights relevance. So respondents report that poor local enforcement of laws, that happens a lot, labour laws are constantly not enforced by government authorities, is a leading barrier to their firm addressing human rights issues, um, but they are generally likely to see this as um, more likely than other companies, um, that, uh, than other company operations as having relevance um, in, in their human rights um, activities. So basically, to kind of conclude, are we, am I just, is this report only talking about the big visible companies like Coca-Cola and Apple? Um, big business and human rights cuts across all um, companies, whether they are very recognisable brands um, or they're really big, you know, Fortune 500 companies. Um, the change we want to see, I guess, for particularly the rock stars of, um, you know, businesses and human rights, like the leading companies that this um, report has identified, is uh, that it, it, it is spread throughout, um, you know, all parts of the sector and that the competitors um, will also be um, accountable and... Um, undertake activities to improve rights and protections for workers um, along the supply chains. Because if only a few of them are doing it, like the Apples and the, the Coca-Colas, um, the same competitors in their sectors can go off the radar, can go under the radar, and it can easily become then a race to the bottom. And we're already seeing it as well. Um, some of the dodgy companies um, that um, you know don't see human rights as relevant to their activities and want to outcompete um, sort of the leading companies on price, 
particularly in manufacturing, are moving to Bangladesh, Cambodia, and Sri Lanka. They're moving away from China because um, there's been new labor laws and also um, generally wages have also increased in China over the last few years. One last comment is um, concerns, um, as an academic, I always like to identify areas for further research. Um, and for me, it's about having a grassroots view of business and human rights. I think the report has focused very importantly on the view at the top, um, because you know we are interested in what senior executives and corporate leaders um, are thinking about human rights, and it really, you know, initiatives really have to come to the t come from the top. Um, but at the same time, the report points to the relevance of the expectations of employees as critical internal stakeholders in the company uh, in terms of its values and actions to um, respect human rights. So I would be interested, um, maybe The Economist could do a further report um, in conjunction with the Centre for Rights and Justice um, about how, um, how employees understand human rights the obligations of the businesses that they work in. And perhaps also their role in shaping human rights policies um, in those companies. Because I think this bottom-up employee perspective um, of how, for example, internal corporate communications to employees about human rights issues, as well as the involvement of employees in um, shaping and developing um, and implementing these businesses' human rights policies, will be very worthy of uh, further inquiry. Uh, so I'll conclude with these comments and I look forward to um, your questions. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mimi. Uh, now we move on to, uh, to Q&A. Um, I think, yes, we've got some microphones over here. For, if you don't think you're going to be able to be heard well enough in this, uh, this auditorium. So please, if you uh, kindly raise your hands if you've got uh, questions, points, contributions. A young lady over here. Thank you. Back on the right. Thank you. If you can you say, uh, just give your name and who, where you're from, just so okay. you can... Uh, I'm Suki from Amnesty International, and uh, I was the former director at Labour Action China. So um, my questions come from my previous 10 years experience on the ground on the labour activism in China. So you mentioned about having a grassroots views about how the um, human rights can be implemented in business. But from my past 10 experience on the ground, um, we have so many frustrations um, that uh, most of the companies actually they would like to deal with the easy issues. Like um, we have seen a lot of significant changes and improvement in occupational health and safety, wages, or discrimination on child labor. However, when it comes to the very fundamental labor rights such as trade unionizing, collective bargaining, and freedom of association, I can, I can say most of the companies, particularly the transnational corporations, are very reluctant to handle or to deal with this issue with the workers, as well as with the civil society organizations. So, so I would like to, to, to know, I mean, how far can these soft laws, or even the international treaties, such as the OECD guidelines, can really be implemented to empower workers or employees to exercise this fundamental human rights. Um, and I, also, I would also like to see, I mean, the, what are the real commitment of the international companies when it comes to like the, the um, major labor or, uh, or human rights violations? For example, when we uh, identify the, the violations of Foxconn, they sent a letter to sue, sue me, actually sue my organization for defamation. And, and I sent a letter to Tim Cook, and Tim Cook said, we don't want to talk to civil society organizations. So I would say there are so many frustrations we have seen I mean, yeah, on the ground. So I would like to see how we can bridge the gaps and the and the loopholes in the process of improving the CSR practices. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the short question. Um, <laughs> Mimi. I, I'm afraid I can't give a short answer, so I'm going to be have to be really brief. Um, I think that's. Um, thank you very much for your contribution. Um, I think it's really um, it's great to have civil society here today, and I've also worked with civil society, um, uh, for example, the China Labour Bulletin, um, on issues of. Um, 
uh, Chinese uh, labor law developments in the last few years. So it's always great to get you know a very honest and frank perspective that you've given us on actually the um, the stickiness of certain issues like um, free free uh, right to join free trade unions and also. Um, the right to collective bargaining in the context of um, multinationals. I can only say uh, my pers my perspective is, is really more familiar. I'm more familiar with the Chinese context, um, where trade unions play a very different role to Western trade unions. Um, so, um, in a previous role, I was doing a lot of research on human resource um, strategies of companies, and um, one of the Companies is a massive um, Asian automaker um, who operates factories, um, auto assembly factories in um, China, and they're they're used to trade unions back in their country being very militant. And when they come to China, they were really scared of actually dealing with any sort of trade unions, um, and and the same you could say for like Walmart and the KFC because those. American companies um, have traditionally been very hostile to trade unions. Um, when they come to China, they realize actually our trade unions are a bit different. Um, you know, we are, I think Stephen's comment about being attentive to the sort of political social context of where we are is very important. Chinese trade unions is part of the party state. Okay, so I can understand some of your frustrations because I have friends who are labor activists who are like, well, actually workers in China cannot belong to any other trade unions. It's the ACFTU, the All China Confederation of Trade Unions. And so obviously that um, China hasn't signed up to Convention um, 87 or 98 because Freedom Association, which is Convention 87, is essential for collective bargaining, um, which is Convention 97, to be effective. And so um, these multinationals that I've um, interviewed um, I said, well, you know, we have to work with Chinese trade unions because often, say they have a joint venture as well, then you'll have sort of a very funny management structure where trade union bosses are also HR managers and they're also on the management committee. Okay, so it's a very different scene of industrial relations in China. Um, and, um, you know, that's why I see a really important role for civil society to be involved because trade unions in other countries have traditionally been the voice of workers. Um, it's hard to say that they, um, not that I'm saying that ACFTU isn't doing a great job lately of trying to promote, at least on paper, a lot of collective agreements, because you know they have like millions of collective agreements in China, but obviously there's a difference between numbers, which Chinese are very good at, and then actually what is uh, in practice. Um, and those agreements, I've looked at many of them, they're just a replica of the labor law. So collective bargaining, the whole point is to get, you know, race to the top. It's like trying to get better wages and conditions than the minimum um, required by law. But yeah, having looked at lots of these um, collective agreements by Chinese unions, um, you know, it, it, I don't have a lot of hope. Um, so civil society can definitely play a bigger role. And um, yeah, I'll stop there. Is Laura might want to say something. I was just going to say uh, in sympathy that Apple doesn't speak to the media either, so. <laughs> I, was, I was just going to add that uh, as a result of, some of you may have seen, as a result of last week's uh, election in the UK, the, uh, the new government in the UK is, is, is announcing an even greater tightening of the uh, right to strike and right to collective bargaining in the UK, so uh, it, 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 it isn't unique to this part of the world, I think, some of, this, uh, some of the attitudes that are, that are prevalent. Any other points? Yes, please. Sorry, and, and my, my comment earlier, Suki, thank you so much for your contribution. I, I, I shouldn't have been naughty, but playing around. Please. Uh, uh, hi, my name's Galvin Chia. I work at the Fung Global Institute of Impact, so neither a practitioner nor a theoretician, just someone who's interested, I suppose. Um, in, in your surveys, I suppose, of, of these executives, as well as of the literature and of the, the sort of 10-year suit that you mentioned, to what extent have these change in attitudes been uh, either A, sort of driven by the executive, driven by the C-suite, or B, have relied on civil action, civil society, naming and shaming? It's a chicken and egg question, but in, in, what, how do you see the relationship between those two forces? That's a very good question. 
I think it's been a combination of factors. I think that um, the attempts to promote the uh, and disseminate the, uh, the 2011 guiding principles that were introduced um, has had an impact, but I think also uh, the media attention that has been um, focused on events that have happened in the past few years, um, some of the, the tragedies that we've all mentioned here tonight, I think has probably had a, a force, and I think it's just, it's come on the agenda every way you, you look at it. Um, it's something that people know about and talk about, and I think companies have to think about it. I think, um, sorry, I was just going to add supplement to that. I think there's also some, some, some pressure. I'm not too sure what the numbers would be, if you like, from, from the bottom, if I could call it that. You know, with, with whatever you want to call it, Gen Y or whatever you want to call it, from genuinely from, from the bottom, where I think M, the C suite are, are recognizing, you know, messages coming, coming through the workforce saying actually some of these things are really important. They're important to us. If you want us to work for your organization, you need to do something about it, please. Uh, and actually, I only want to work for organizations that are like that. And, uh, you know, I think you've, 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 there are a number of it, um, you know, meaning you can probably reel off as to the organizations that, that have taken those attitudes. And it, whether it's to do with, with uh, you know, business and human rights or whether it's to do with other aspects of, of the environment or, or whatever, the different aspects of, of our everyday life, not just, not just money making. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Sharon Hong. I'm the uh, Executive Director of Human Rights in China, which is in Hong Kong and um, New York. Um, and we've uh, really focused for 25 years on ways to support civil society in China and also the development of standards and international human rights standards and having input into that and really promote the implementation and realization of that within China, within the system, within the legal system, within, you know, etc. And this conversation, I want to thank both Mizar and the uh, Congress for creating space to look at this question. Um, I think it's actually before the 90s, but it's, you know, a lot of tension on this issue it was in the 90s. And I want to urge um, the next part of the road, thinking, because it's a long road. Um, I would like to urge that whether it is the design of new research, uh, the production of knowledge, as it were, so that we can knowledge and we figure out where we're going, how to go, if to go, and whatever. And the standard setting process, and the implementation and training, which was you know, identified as an issue, and in monitoring, that uh, it's not to try to engage civil society more, or to talk to civil society more, or listen to the you know, grassroots more. I think it's really to think holistically and integrate for a whole process that involves civil society from every part of these not only as interlocutors, not only as a group, but you know, through the whole process. And I would just want to put a plug here for um, the model that's being developed by the Global Network Initiative, of which we are one of the founding uh, member, NGO members, uh, along with Human Rights Watch, along with Committee to Protect Journalists and the Human Rights Committee. But that multi-stakeholder approach really thought about how do we develop standards that are sectorally specific and useful, and then where we've learned you know, is that it's very difficult to develop that with these different stakeholders, but that's the only shot of having them mean anything and having them, you know, be useful. But that's for the ICT sector. But the stakeholders were not civil society and business. The stakeholders were major and different size ICT companies, the biggies, Global, Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, and then Facebook has joined us, and, you know, and then small companies, startups, etc. But it's socially responsible investors. That made the huge difference when the big pension funds came in, and et cetera. And we work very closely with large auditors and auditing firms and all these different kinds of expertise and experts. So I, I think it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's not the silver bullet. But I think the approach is right to have an inclusive, full range of full participation and then I think we have a lot to learn from each other, and it hasn't been easy the last seven, eight years. It was a really hard process, and I don't think it's perfect, but I think at least we're trying to do it together. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, just, just to sort of add on to that, um, I did mention 
um, for those who have waded through the 112 pages of the uh, reporting framework that came out just a couple of months ago, complete with implementation guides. Actually, it's, it's well written, I think, in, in my view. It's, it's written in, in pretty plain English, if you're a native English speaker. Um, but, the, uh, but, but interestingly, to pick up on your point about investors, um, I, I saw from, from a, uh, uh, I suppose one, one is to trust this, but um, from, a, from a press release that went out with, it, with this report, that 67, I'm quoting here, 67 investors, so this is professional investors, exactly the kind of pension funds, etc. you're talking about, 67 investors representing nearly $4 trillion US dollars of assets under management have signed a statement of support for this reporting framework. And uh, I think a number of companies, half a dozen or so, uh, companies from five different industries are early adopters of these, of these principles here. Um, including Unilever, who was the first, Ericsson, H&M, Nestle, and Newmont. Newmont's a mining, big mining, US uh, mining company. Um, so, I mean, it's small steps, I guess, but, but things are starting to happen. And as I say, I think as the, as the assurance standards, which are, you know, will, will provide the, the wrapper, if you like, around the reporting standards, I know this all sounds a bit rather boring and technical, but these are really essential to getting, to getting, getting us exactly where you're talking about. But those assurance standards are currently, uh, uh, you know, currently being drafted and, and uh, will be exposed, as I understand it, about this time next year. Um, so that will start to you know, accelerate this process, hopefully. Because I think a lot of companies are finding the feedback from these. We, we've had similar um, sessions to this in, in uh, London, in, in Paris, in Geneva, in New York, and just last week in Washington. And, and one of the main issues, typically, that has come out from there is, well, this is terrific, but what happens next, and how do we go about it, and, and particularly for a corporate, you know, how, how do we learn? How do we get information? What do we do now? And, and that, I think, is the main, uh, perhaps one of the main findings that came out of the research by the EIU, while, while you've got this very significant interest by corporates, business, in what does all this mean for us. Yes, we're very interested, it's high on our agenda, but then what can we, what can we do about it? And, and so there's this, this uh, uh, mismatch, if you like, between it, it, it's, a, it's a high... Uh, priority as far as the action list is concerned on, on the C-suite agenda, but in reality, what practically they, can they do about it? You know, so there is a big demand, if you like, for education, training, uh, and, and guidance, whatever wording you want to use, in order to take uh, and accelerate this to uh, to another level. Sorry, enough from me. I'm supposed to be facilitating, not preaching. <laughs> any, any other questions, contributions? If not, I know we've run over time a little bit, but uh, thank you so much for staying, and thank you again for coming. Uh, it's been really, uh, really interesting, and thank you to the very much. And, and if, if it's still there, please help yourselves to more food and drink outside. No waste, all right? No waste. We'll, we'll take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much.